actually, if I could uh, introduce our next speaker, William B. Davis, because I think I'm uh, just a, an enormous X Files fan. I <laughs> love this program so much. But I think the best thing I could do to introduce William B. Davis is to say, of the X-Files universe, where apparently every mythological being simultaneously exists, there are werewolves and vampires and aliens and ghosts, somehow William B. Davis, with just a raised eyebrow and a cigarette, was more scary than all of them. <laughs> Much. And I hope I don't scare you too much uh, this morning. It's a little early for that, but uh, uh, so I'm just uh, delighted to be here. I'm very honored to be here. We we have an expression. I'm just going to test that I really can actually walk away from this, and you can still. Oh, that's great. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's uh, we have an expression in the theater of. Uh, as, as actors, there, there's a certain situation when, when a previous performance is, is wonderful and brilliant and, and we say, okay, follow that. Well, that's how I feel this morning after yesterday. Uh, yesterday was just astonishing, I thought. I've been to a lot of these conferences and I was just amazed at the quality of speaker, uh, the quality of thought, the, the oratorical skills of the speakers, and uh, now I have to follow that. Um, <laughs> but I want to just congratulate Bill on what he's been able to put together because I think this is definitely at these things because we have these uh, really intelligent scientists, these well-informed people on a whole range of subjects uh, with a skill and a knowledge that they bring to bear. And what do I actually have to bring to this? Uh, I'm an actor, but but even, even as an actor, I wasn't really an actor until I was in my 50s. Um, I was a director and an acting teacher. But I do want to apologize to people who couldn't get the book. I was amazed at, uh, that they sold out. I was flattered and uh, very delighted that they did. Uh, you can actually get the book and you can get it uh, from my, we get it at a, well, you get it various places and bookstores, but if you want to get it dedicated, just uh, go to my website and there's a way to go through and we will send you a dedicated uh, a copy of the book. There is also a, uh, an audio version of the book if you like to listen on in the car or whatever. Uh, I did the narration for the audio version of the book, so that's available as well. So, uh, I'm going to do a, sort of a bit of an introduction then uh, there'll be basically three parts to what I want to talk about. Uh, the first part would be sort of my early life uh, and how living with belief affected my early life and what happened to me. Uh, the second part will be uh, the X-Files and what that experience was. <laughs> and the third part, I'm going to take take a, a page from Louise Anthony's book and, or a liberty that she opened up and I'm going to engage in some political and more, perhaps more serious discussion uh, on topics that are really important to me from a Canadian perspective. Um, but first just to clarify, we talk about uh, imagine no religion and, and what do we mean by uh, religion. What do we mean by imagining no religion? And of course religion means God, it means all those things, but it also means, or at least for the purposes of my talk today, and the purpose of my experience in the X-Files, it means a deeply held belief about which we have no scientific evidence, so we cannot establish, we cannot prove it. Uh, but, but that begs a question for me, because I live that way all the time. I live by 
uh, beliefs that I have no evidence for. Uh, somebody tells me, my doctor tells me it's good to have a flu shot. So I get a flu shot. But a hundred years ago, my doctor would tell me it would be good to have bloodletting for my illness. So I would probably have had bloodlet. How do I know? How do, how do I know what to trust? In fact, the science tells me that there's no good reason for a man to have a PSA test, that the evidence is that there's no, uh, no proof of the uh, mortality benefit on a, on, a, on a broad scale for people who have PSA tests. Okay, but I'm me. I want my PSA test. I want to know if my prostate is, a, is at risk or not. So, so how do we how do we traverse our way through this uh, this complicated world? Uh, I mean, for instance, okay. Even if I go by science, science tells me that actually this is not really solid. This is mostly air. But I put the glass on and it stays. Ah, it's a big little world. Um, but at any rate, uh, and what about, I guess what we might call the environmental religions? The, because uh, uh, I think of myself as an environmentalist, but I'm beginning to think that environmentalists are the problem and not the solution. What about environmental religions like nuclear power is bad, fracking is bad, GM food is bad. What about those religions? How do we deal with those? Uh, how do we find the science or how do we find our way through that? But the end of all this is my question, why am I here? Why am I standing in front of you? What do I have to offer you? And Really, all I have to say is, well, Bill asked me, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is where it started. <laughs> the cigarette smoking man at age three. Um, pretty much ready to believe anything he's told, I think. Um, depends very much on his parents. I should say, by the way, that um, while I will talk about my personal life, I, apologize, I don't apologize, but uh, compared to the stories that we heard yesterday, my life as a middle-class uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in Ontario is relatively benign. But still it raises questions that are of value and of interest. So anyway, here I was, and I was not subjected to uh, many of the traditional deep religions or faiths that uh, uh, Christianity was in the background, but it was never really part of my parents' life. But uh, there was one, one faith that I was given, and it was deeply held and deeply important to me. <laughs> so, for several years, I believed he came down our chimney and put presents in my stocking and under the tree. And that was an act of faith. It was a religion, if you like. I believed it with all my heart. And the day that I learned that it was false, I will never forget. <laughs> Bill Brunt was the man's name. Well, he was a, a boy of seven, I think. <laughs> and he said, there's no such thing as Santa Claus. It's your parents. Oh, my God. <laughs> Devastation. Well, I suppose that's all we have to do with the God believers is say, no, it's not God, it's other people. Uh, uh, 
I'm just a little confused for a moment. Here we go. Sorry. Um, so, yes, yeah, so when did religion actually come into my life? Uh, I remember being in grade one, and uh, I had some really nice friends. Uh, I was just getting used to being in school, and we were having a nice chat. Um, and then a little later, I, had, I met some other people from grade two, and they were pretty smart. And they told me something really important. They said, Jews are bad, because we were in a fairly Jewish community. Oh, oh, that's interesting to know. So I went back to my other friends, and I said, look, this is what I can tell you. Jews are bad. They walked away. <laughs> So, another introduction to religion <laughs> and the effects of religion and how it affects people. But the, the next thing which I want to read from my book happened when I got to rural Ontario. The family moved to rural Ontario in the early 50s and uh, I was in high school, grade 11 I think. And uh, it was a fairly boring school, but uh, drama was not entirely lacking. We had a history professor who had already hit me on the head because I didn't have my textbook at the beginning of the year. We were supposed to buy our own textbooks in those days. Um, but well, apart from that, uh, one day our history teacher was asking the class about the Reformation. This was the same teacher who had whacked me on the head earlier in the year when the textbook I had ordered had still not arrived. Attempting to show up our ignorance of the Reformation, he said to the class, if you had been living in the 15th century, you would all have been Catholics, right? Pause. Anyone here who wouldn't have been a Catholic in the 15th century? Well, to be honest, I didn't remember when the Reformation was. But I still didn't think I would have been Catholic. And so I timidly raised my hand. What? You wouldn't have been a Catholic in the 15th century? I don't think so, sir. Ah, well, come up here, come up here, come up here. Stand here. So he brought me up to the front of the class. He demanded I stand beside his desk in the front of the room. You know that all Christians in the 15th century were Catholics, hmm? Lying, I said, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> and you wouldn't have been Catholic? No, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, astonished, he replied. Uh, aren't you a Christian? <laughs> Uh, well, what do you mean by a Christian, sir? <laughs> he began to splutter and to foam at the mouth. <laughs> well, someone who uh, <clears throat> uh, follows the teachings of Christ. So I said, well, I think you'd better count me out, sir. <laughs> There are a lot of assumptions behind all of that, uh, not least of which was in 1952 in rural Ontario, everyone was Christian. There were no Jews, there were no Muslims, there were no atheists, there was no nothing else, to, everyone was Christian. Um, and of course, everyone but me. Um, well, something I hadn't even really thought about very much. Um, but after that, whoa, they came, the students came to me, haven't you been saved? Oh my God, oh, they worried about me, especially the girls. Um, but, uh, so it was, it was really setting the cat among the pigeons, as they say. But it's kind of, it's interesting because many years later when I wrote the book, and I had someone help me with, you know, she was a very good editor person in the early stages of the book, and she read some of the first chapters and helped me with some advice on it and so on. Uh, 
I thanked her. We were at my house, and then she left. And then she came back, and she rang the doorbell. Oh, there's one thing. There's one thing. Uh, I, you don't say, or I don't know how you came to your non-belief. She was a Christian. Oh, right, I thought. Yes, I haven't said anything about that. Thank you, thank you. And I thought about that because I don't think you come to non-belief. You come to belief. Surely the question is to her. Mm -hmm. How did you come to your belief? Non-belief is the default. <laughs> we're not really atheists. We're just people without belief. I'm not an a Santa Clausist. <laughs> I'm just a person who doesn't believe in that. But this is how my life began. But but life was to get better for me because I was about to go to university, and this is the Sir Daniel Wilson residence at the University of College, the University of Toronto. And I was very nervous about leaving rural Ontario and going to the University of Toronto. And uh, I'd only been there a day or two, and I, there's a, this kind of entranceway through here, and this was the common room. And to sort of get to your room, you had to pass this kind of vestibule that the common room was. And I'm passing through, and I hear this voice calling to me and saying, Do you believe in God? I said, a little tentatively, but uh, no. <laughs> well, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> and there I was, in a group of atheists, a group of skeptics, a group of philosophers. The person who called me in was John Woods, who... Uh, Later, he was a, uh, a president of the University of Lethbridge, uh, as a world-class philosopher, and knew more arguments for the non-existence of God than I could believe, I could imagine. And we had a wonderful time. I was wonderfully accepted. Uh, but the sad part of the story is John Woods, delightful man, still going strong, but returned to the Catholic Church. Don't ask me. <laughs> but uh, I had a very happy time uh, living in that world, and I was, uh, my, my, my parents who had never really been Christian, but by that time my mother was in the Unitarian Church, and uh, one time I gave the, uh, I gave the uh, youth address on Youth Sunday, told them they shouldn't call themselves a church, they shouldn't meet on Sunday mornings, they shouldn't pretend to look like Christians, and then I left. <laughs> and beyond that, nothing terribly exciting in terms of belief and not belief and paranormal or anything happened to my life until this. <laughs> so, what am I? I'm an actor, right? The show auditioned for people in Vancouver. I'm an actor, so I auditioned. I actually auditioned for a part with three lines. I didn't get that part. I got this other part with no lines. It just stands around and smokes. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. It's a gig. I was paid. Not much, but I was paid. Um, Fortunately, I don't invest in these things because I thought a show about alien abduction had about as much chance of being picked up and successful as the Chicago Cubs winning the World Series. But, uh, with Vancouver Canucks winning his Stanley Cup. <laughs> yeah, too bad about that. <laughs> um, anyway, um, um, we did it and I became part of this show. And gradually more and more part of the show. And, uh, You know, it dealt with these sort of subjects. Unidentified flying objects, for instance. And, and, and I would go to conventions, I would go to places, and people would assume 
that since I was in the show, not understanding that actors do the work they get, that I had chosen to be in this because I believed in these things. And, and they would come to me and they would invite me to go on skywalks, or skywatches, where we could look and we could see UFOs. Or um, people brought me special information about Area 51 so I could know more about the uh, government conspiracy that was covering up these things. And, and uh, I, you know, I had to say, you know, I actually don't believe in these things. <laughs> well, the, 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 once they got over their astonishment, they, they said, well, why not? And I said, well, well, the onus is not on me to prove that these things exist. The onus is on you to prove that they do. I can't prove that they don't exist any more than I can prove there aren't fairies in the bottom of my car, to quote Richard Dawkins, who we will talk about a little later. Uh, and they said, oh, but we have proved these things. Oh. Oh. Well, that stopped me. I didn't know kind of what to do about that, because I didn't know what proof they had, they had found. So, that led me to finding, by, uh, by happenstance, a radio broadcast with Barry Beierstein, the late but wonderful Barry Beierstein. And I heard about PSYCOP. And I contacted Barry, and I became a member of PSYCOP, and I found the skeptics, and I found all the stuff. I found Joe Nickel, I found what they found about Area 51, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And, uh, Partly that's why I suppose why I'm here, because that led me into the whole skeptical movement, because now I had things to say to these people, not that it would change their mind or anything, but at least I knew <laughs> what the stories were. <laughs> <laughs> Alien abduction. So, so people believe, many people believe, still do, that they're being abducted by aliens and taken to alien spaceships up in the air, blah, blah, blah. One of the, uh, one of the great uh, proponents of this, or advocates of this uh, idea, was John Mack, who was a professor of Harvard, uh, uh, at Harvard University. Mm -hmm. He'd already won a Pulitzer Prize for a book on perception. Very, very bright man, very well regarded. And he was convinced that these people that he was now meeting and interviewing were actually being abducted, and he called them pioneers on a hero's journey. They were going into space. They were connecting to the alien presence. I don't know if they were invaders or what, how, how he saw them. And it so happened that again, because people are confused about acting and, well, I mean, I guess the A-list actors could choose who they, where they were, but <laughs> we in the trenches, we work where we can. So they thought that I was really interested and knowledgeable and probably a believer in these things. Asked me to moderate a panel between John Mack on the one side and uh, some skeptic, or I don't remember who it was, on the other side, and I was to be the moderator. Uh, we soon discovered that I was farther over on this side than the other person, that I was the, 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 the biggest materialist in the room. But we engaged in this debate, and it, it went on and went on and went on. Uh, he had a video that professed to show uh, conclusively what was happening. Um, but it was clear that, well, it was clear, but it was probably clear to those who were expert in the field that he was unwittingly indoctrinating uh, his interviewees. But it's so difficult to find any evidence one way or another. Someone claims they were being abducted. Uh, someone thinks they weren't. Where do you find proof? What actual evidence could you look at? Well, in conversation afterwards, this was curious because John Mack said with some surprise that some of the abductees reported, the abductees whom he believed every word they said, some of these abductees reported that they had seen him 
<laughs> on one of the spaceships. <laughs> I see you're connecting the dots that he didn't connect. <laughs> he knew he had never been on the spaceship, so he knew that that statement was false, and that was the only testable statement. So he had one testable statement, and it's false. Didn't change his mind. <laughs> uh, curious. <laughs> Still. I had a, was having a lovely time on the show. My career was advancing. I was uh, uh, getting more money. I was getting more praise. I was getting more acting experience. My work was getting better. And then something happened. <laughs> you probably recognize him. Um, so, what does that have to do with my career and the x -Lives? Well, let me read you what he was, I should point out at the time, my hero. I had read, I think, every word he had published, at least in a book form. So, when he said this at his Dimbleby lecture in 1996, I had to listen. He said, how do we account for the current paranormal vogue in the popular media? Perhaps it has something to do with the millennium, well this was close to uh, the millennium, in which case it's depressing to realize the millennium is still three years away. Less portentously, it may be an attempt to cash in on the success of the X-Files. This is fiction, and therefore defensible as pure entertainment. A fair defense, you might think. <coughs> Wish I could do this with his English accent. A fair defense, you might think. But soap operas, cop series, and the like are justly criticized if week after week they ram home the same prejudice or bias. Each week, the X-Files poses a mystery and offers two rival kinds of explanations, the rational theory and the paranormal theory. And week after week, the rational explanation loses, and the paranormal theory wins. But it's only fiction, a bit of fun. Why get so hot under the collar? Imagine a crime series in which every week there is a white suspect and a black suspect. <laughs> and every week, lo and behold, the black one turns out to have done it. Unpardonable, of course. And my point is that you could not defend it by saying that it's only fiction, only entertainment. Let's not go back to a dark age of superstition and unreason, a world in which every time you lose your keys, you suspect poltergeists, demons, or alien abduction. <coughs> <laughs> so, my hero thinks the show I am doing <laughs> is dangerous, is bad, uh, should not be encouraged. What do I do? <laughs> I suppose if I were Mulder, <laughs> and believed in my convictions, I would have resigned from the show, declared it a terrible thing, and said, I stand up for reason, I stand against the X-Files, I withdraw from the show. I didn't really want to do that. <laughs> so I thought about it a little bit more. And then I thought, hmm, a couple of things. Well, the first one was, you know, imagine a show in which every week an explanation is posed by a man and another explanation is posed by a woman and the man always wins. Unpardonable. But that's what happens in the x -Files. Mulder is always right, Scully is always wrong. By the way, I meant to explain the show. Are there people who don't know the show? Shall I have said what this show is about? Anyway, you probably picked it up by now. Um, so, so... Why are the feminists not alarmed? Why are the feminists not up in arms saying, what do you mean only the men win? Uh, in fact, uh, quite the reverse happened. The feminists loved Scully, got totally behind her, and thought she was fantastic. 
So, okay, so that argument was a little shaky, but still, still a little concerned. <coughs> now, what does, oh, oh by the way, <laughs> yes, another thing I wondered, was, had he actually watched the show? <laughs> I mean, people recognized me all over the world. Um, and I was at a convention, so I thought I'd talk to him about this. So I went up to him, and he looked at me with a glazed stare, and I said, you know, I wanted to mention about the X-Files. Oh, he said, oh, oh, were well, you on the show? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but then there's another thing that he always says. Uh, he says, when he, about God and various things, he says, it depends on the evidence. The evidence. So then, what is his evidence that this show about the paranormal is encouraging other people to believe in the paranormal? I notice a lot of the skeptics love the show. <laughs> and I don't think you believe in alien abduction. So I would go to conventions and I would I would conduct at least a straw poll and I would ask how many people believed there were aliens among us, how many people believed there were alien abductions, and I would get a show of hands that was about the same as was being reported in the general population. So from this very weak study, I concluded that the show has not actually changed anybody's mind on these subjects. And I began to feel better about that. Of course, I did ask them how many people believed in conspiracies, <laughs> and every hand went up. <laughs> <laughs> and that one mystified me because this was during Monica Lewinsky time. And uh, I thought, you know, if the president can't keep secret uh, 11 private meetings with an intern, how in God's name is he keeping secret a whole world of aliens and alien abductions? And, and that didn't convince anybody either. Um, but what all this did was it eased my mind. Thank you very much, Dr. Dawkins, but I will stay on the show. And I did. Um, but you know, thinking about it later, there were actually dangers on the show, not the ones that he mentioned so much, as what might be called the embedded assumptions. Uh, the ones that were examined, you know, that Mulder and Scully would actually look at, okay, so everybody could look at that. But what about the ones that were just taken for granted by the show? Uh, there's one about uh, uh, spiritual healing or a a uh, healing ceremony that is the only way that Mulder can recover from a certain illness. And he's taken by Native Indians to some place and he is healed by this process. We don't question that. That's just taken as an assumption. There are other, there are other things where, where um, Scully is investigating uh, or concerned about things in her past and uh, and so she goes to a, a therapist who takes her on regressive memory. And she has to stop because she's covering certain things and, she, and so on. But the point is, repressed memory was taken as an assumption, an embedded assumption, that we repress traumatic experience and we have to unlock it through psychotherapy. And we know that it's a terribly, terribly dangerous uh, uh, idea through the 80s and 90s and many people went to jail because their, their children were, were brought through hypnotism to believe that they had been sexually abused or satanic cults, etc., etc., all of which has been termed, proven to be bogus. Uh, so the show was not without uh, risk in that sense, but not quite in the sense that uh, uh, Dawkins says, I think. Um, how's my time? You think I said, did my watch off? So another time I went, oh, okay. okay. <coughs> <laughs> so now we move to. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. 
Dr. Sahel said something that caught my ear yesterday about Pakistan. And he said that about the president, that when they have control of the religious, the political, and the economic, they have, I'm not sure how he described it, but they have total control of the society. Is that what we have now in Canada? It's a question. The religious side is obviously not talked about, but he is a born-again Christian. If you are a born-again Christian, you know that God looks after you, God looks after your children, God looks after your grandchildren, the humans are a special species, and not subject necessarily to the same laws of nature that other creatures might be. We know that until there's some shift in the center and the center left, he has a locked in majority. Uh, it's hard to imagine how that can be changed in the foreseeable future. And we know that he, so he has the political power and we know that he has big business, big power, big oil on his side. So he has the economic power. Why should we care? Well, for starters, he's repressing science. We know that. He has cut huge amounts of funding to science. He's cut back environmental, uh, environmental studies on projects. He's cut back the project, uh, protection of navigable waters to a tiny portion of what it used to be. Uh, he has government scientists now cannot speak to the press, to the public, without prior approval by the Prime Minister's office. The Prime Minister's office must approve the message that a government scientist that we pay for has to report to the population. Is this a democracy? But what troubles me the most about this is we have not yet hardly mentioned today, yesterday, the, to what is to me the issue confronting us the most. And that is, of course, climate change. And what can we do about climate change and what are the risks? We've heard fascinating talks today and yesterday about all these different things. But are we simply shuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic? We're not looking at the iceberg. <coughs> and how do we deal with that subject? Um, <laughs> I mean, as uh, I've forgotten it. It'll, it'll come to me about the British journalist. Um, say, you know, it's not actually about, as he said, the sodding polar bears. It's actually about us. And how do we deal with this issue? Uh, I was fascinated uh, yesterday by Peter Bogosian talking about how you confront people with deeply held beliefs about God and so on, and, and being pre-contemplative, and, and the way you can deal with the questioning. Because what do you do with the climate change deniers? How do you deal with them? I go to my brother and I present facts. People present facts, facts, facts. Nothing happens, nothing changes. Uh, and as one study I've heard about, I think it's been replicated, that if someone holds something deeply, and you present the clear argument against what it was they held deeply, the result will be that their deep belief will be stronger than it was before. It does not change. So I thought Peter had some really interesting ideas of how you get around that, because we obviously were terrified of confirmation, uh, or what not, of uh, cognitive dissonance. And we, propelled by confirmation bias, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't have time with climate change. We can't work our way slowly through this. We have to move now. Well, yesterday, the parts per million 
last week hit 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that is more than it's been for millions of years. The scientists that I've seen say 350 is what's acceptable, we're at 400. Uh, when the IPCC report came out in 2007, I assumed we would just change the way we lived. Uh, it was just obvious. It was more, a lot more significant than 2011, or 2009, uh, that we would all change. We would do different things. We would stop flying in airplanes. We would not have conferences like this, or we would, but we'd do them by remote. Uh, <laughs> because we wouldn't want to fly. Uh, that just, and yet, soon, you know, everything went back to normal. And we kept doing the same things that we've been doing. And I, you know, I have to say to, uh, to the Randy Foundation, I have to say, because it just hit me in the gut. And I don't know, I'm not a scientist, so I'll just say, check the science about cruise ships before you go on another cruise, please. What I've read about cruise ships and the damage they do to the environment and their carbon emissions is horrific. And when I was in the Bahamas recently and I saw those ships coming in, and I thought, it's like the end of the world. It's just coming to us. We have to stop this. We can't, can't, can't keep doing this. Um, but I don't know the science, so all I ask, I mean, I, I know what I read, but I'm not a scientist, so I just ask you to read the science, to check the science. Um, so, Louise Anthony spoke of the dangers of the U.S. government and said many things which I agree with. But nobody is yet talking about the dangers of the Canadian government. And this will bring, I forgot how many billions of barrels of oil, not oil, bitumen, from the tar sands to the Gulf of Mexico. The tar sands oil is the most carbon, uh, emitting fuel there is, more than coal. Uh, and we have billions and billions of it in the tar sands. And as uh, James Hansen said, if we exploit all of that, we're done. We're done. The planet will heat beyond there. And yet, our government is advocating, pushing, driving this. And it's understandable, it's jobs, it's money, it's economy, blah, 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 blah. But the risk is huge. I don't want to say it, I don't want to be alarmist and say it's definitely, I just want to say the risk is huge. And it may well be that when we look back years from now, it won't be the American government that we are concerned about in the, what happens to the world. It'll be the Canadian government. Thank you very much, and it's probably time for some questions. To, to try to control that development, to just say, okay, I mean, we've been doing this, uh, we're doing what we're doing, uh, why do we need to expand what we're doing, 
why not just do what we're doing for now? Uh, but eventually, you know, uh, sooner rather than later, later rather than we have to move off that that source of fuel and on to something else, which will also create jobs. But unfortunately, when you move from one economic to another, somebody loses and other people gain. So, so how long have they been there? How long have they been doing that? It's been there all their life? I don't think so. They've been there five years, right? So maybe they can build nuclear power plants next, next week. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your talk. That was really wonderful. Um, I really appreciated the call to arms. So my question is, when will you be running for prime minister? <laughs> big supporter of George Heyman in my writing of Fairview, and he's been, he was ex executive director of the Sierra Club, and I, uh, I worked with him on something else, and I've been pushing climate change in his ear for some time, and he's very strong on climate change, uh, so I worked very hard to help him get in, but you see what he has to do to get elected, ooh, I mean, he just knocks on doors, knocks on doors, knocks on doors, knocks on doors, so... But if they draft me, uh, I'm interested. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very close to regarding the anti-nuclear crowd as the worst problem for climate change, the people who deny the evidence, because they're against what's the crucial part of the solution. Um, assuming you agree with me what do you, uh, on that, what do you think should be done about that aspect? Uh, and, and tell me if you don't agree and why. No, I do agree. I completely agree. Um, and, you know, the, the James Lovelocks and the Hansons have all supported what you're saying. Uh, and uh, Victor has been a brief speaker that this afternoon, but I know he's uh, quite knowledgeable about that. And, and the newer nuclear reactors that are, are safer. Uh, thorium, I think you said they were from? Thorium, yes. Thorium. Molten salt. Uh, the molten salt yeah. reactors. The molten salt reactors, I take it? Yeah. Yeah, and they, yeah this, 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 uh, by the way, I'd recommend the blog uh, Green, Green View Climate for information. A little bit on that, also on the integral fast reactor, and, a, and it's got a good rundown on why the renewables would be inadequate. Yeah, no, that's true. And then, I mean, obviously the, uh, the Japan thing was just set us back so far mm -hmm. uh, on this whole process. And Germany, which was leading the way in nuclear reactors, is now saying they're going to phase them out and go to renewables. Good luck. Hey, just to bring the uh, conversation back to atheism and skepticism, I'm one of the few heretics in the audience that didn't really watch the show. <laughs> uh, I don't know, like, uh, and for some of the reasons that you touched on in the, in the, in the talk, what do you think, if you were in creative control of the show or um, you know, looking back on it, would you have changed it to be a much more balanced approach of, you know, maybe it's the paranormal thing, maybe it's the, 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 the skeptical, you know, rational viewpoint is possible, or? That's, uh, I mean, that, that's a good question, and I, and I wonder what I would do. I would certainly try to dig out the embedded assumptions and, and try to make sure they're out in the open and, and we're looking at them from both sides. That's about all I could think of at the moment. Hi, I'm Greg from uh, Waterloo. I just wanted to make a comment about what you were saying, and it's sort of a question not to you, but to all of us, is in terms of climate change being so important, uh, most, I think most of this crowd is from Canada, um, and I spent a lot of time in the States. I actually listen to a lot of uh, the preachers down in the States. For me, it's the comedy hour. But the one thing that I find, and I've heard it from many of the mainstream preachers down in the States, is the denial of science uh, and the contempt for uh, skeptical thought in the scientific community and the denial of climate change because their attitude is we're special, we're believers, God's going to take care of us, we have nothing to worry about and this goes in line with the you know, teaching creation and the denial of science. So this is why we have to really push 
um, you know, our agenda, so to speak, you know, because it's for the good of everybody. Just say don't we, so there's a question mark at the end of that, and then the bill will sure. <laughs> Yes. Do you, and do you agree? <laughs> So thank you very much. It's been a great, great pleasure.